Finance Committee to order. Uh, would the clerk please take the roll? Chairman Pearson. Here. Senator De Palma. Senator De Palma, are you there? It's on mute. We'll check back in. Uh, Senator Feleg is here. Yes. Senator Paolino. Here. Senator Acosta. Present. Senator Cano. Here. Senator Murray. Here. Senator Seveny. Here. Senator Sosnowski. Here. Eight members. There is a quorum. You know I'm here. Nine members. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, first on our agenda this evening are several bills that we heard over the last couple of weeks uh, that are uh, ready to proceed. Uh, the first bill is Senate Bill 103 by Senator Coyne, an act relating to taxation, levy, and assessment of local taxes. Senator Felag. Do you have a motion, Senator Felag? You're muted, sir. Sen Senator Felag moves passage, second by Senator Seveny. Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator De Palma. Yes. Senator Felag. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. Senator Acosta. Yes. Senator Cano. Yes. Senator Murray. Yes. Senator Seveny. Yes. Senator Sosnowski. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. That bill will move to the floor. Uh, next in our agenda is Senate Bill 296 by Senator Palma, an act relating to towns and cities, retirement and municipal employees, Middletown Municipal Employees Retirement. Senator Palma moves passage, seconded by Senator Seveny. Would the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator De Palma. Yes. Senator Felag. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. Senator Acosta. No. Was that yes? No. no. Senator Cano. Yes. Senator Murray. Yes. Senator Seveny. Yes. Senator Sosnowski. Yes. Eight in favor, one opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, that bill will move to the floor. Uh, next on our agenda this evening is Senate Bill 363 by Senator Murray, an act relating for passage. An act relating to taxation. North Smithfield, Senator uh, Feel like moves passage, second by Senator Murray. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator De Palma. Yes. Senator Feleg. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. Senator Acosta. Yes. Senator Cano. Yes. Senator Murray. Yes. Senator Seveny. Yes. Senator Sosnowski. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. That bill will move to the floor. Uh, moving on to bills this evening for hearing or consideration, we do have Senator Raptakis with us. Uh, and so we will take up Senate Bill 164 by Senator Raptakis, an act related to taxation, sales and use taxes, liability and competition. Senator Raptakis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. This bill's been introduced many years, and what the uh, gist of the bill is to allow individuals that own a pickup truck, when they want to trade in their pickup truck and buy another pickup truck or buy a, a vehicle, an a, a, a automobile, they are not allowed to exempt the value of the uh, pickup truck. So, for instance, I, I own a truck under 6,000 pounds. I go to a dealer. I want to buy a $20,000 vehicle, an automobile. My vehicle is worth $10,000 in a trade-in, and you cannot deduct that regarding the sales tax that the state's going to charge. So there is no exemption whatsoever. And this is an antiquated law that's been in the books for who knows, 30, 40, 50 years. But if I own an automobile and I want to trade in that same automobile that's worth $10,000 and I'm buying a $20,000 vehicle, I can deduct that $10,000 from the sales tax, saving me $700.
So I don't understand why why we have not uh, uh, addressed this issue. And there's usually the case of, well, it could cause uh, fiscal hardship to the division of taxation. But I don't understand why we treat somebody that owns a pickup truck, regardless of the age of the pickup truck, and you cannot even save whether it be $50, $100, $200, whatever the case might be. So this is something that uh, I think we should try to address, uh, hopefully, again, take another crack at it uh, this year, to make it equitable, regardless if you own a pickup truck. So are we telling anyone that owns a pickup truck, whether they use it for farming, uh, recreational, even for their job, that they cannot trade that uh, pickup truck in to get another pickup truck and use that value of the trade in value to deduct it from uh, the liability of sales tax. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reptakis. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay. Thank you, Senator Reptakis. We do have uh, a fiscal note for this, um, and it would be something that we would have to uh, obviously incorporate in the budget when we, when we do do it. Um, but I do know this is an issue that's come up many times and often, um, and well, it's something we we're going to want to continue looking at. Sure, Mr. Chairman, can I make a comment? Uh, the fiscal note, if you read the fiscal note, there was a lot of cities and towns that there was no fiscal note. Regarding, I think it was seven or eight cities and towns that said that it does not have an impact on their uh, loss of revenue. As far as the state, I did not see yet what that fiscal note could be. Okay. Thank you, Senator Pack. Senator Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Senator. Uh, you know, regarding some of the comments, my, my intuition is that when these tax structures were made, pickup trucks were less common for the layman, and automobiles were, were much more common. And so pickup trucks were seen as um, producing or productive vehicles, whereas now they've been embraced by the average person, which, as you say, might want to might want to trade. And they were also less fuel efficient, more more polluting. Um, that also has changed a bit, I guess. But I guess my question is about the weight, because I, I read different versions of, of this bill and other bills that we're looking at, you know, below 6,000 versus below 14,000. And so at, at which point, you know, where do you stand on this? Um, to your question about the fiscal note, I think it was like 2.8 mil if it was under the, the 6,000, where if it was under 14,000 pounds, it would be like 3.8 mil. So it's about a million dollar difference, depending on, you know, how we classify the trucks by weight. Um, but it, it's all, we're also trying to move away from the adoption of, of these kind of higher polluting cars. And so can you respond to the pollution part, but then also to where you stand on the, on the weight? Would you just want all vehicles that were for personal use exempt from this, or where are you at? Hey, hang on a second. Can you hear me okay? Sorry. Yeah, let me just turn this off. One second. Just get May I answer that question, uh, Mr. Chairman? Absolutely, Senator. Oh, well, sure. Uh, uh, Senator, the, the second bill, we cap it at 8,100 pounds. Reason why, between six and eight, some of these pickup trucks have four door. So that's why I didn't go up to 14,000. I tried to keep the limit. The reason why there's a second bill, and it, it stops at 8,100 pounds. Some of those pickup trucks have four doors, and they weigh a little more. So. Either one of these bills, uh, we think that the, the committee thinks that we should go with the lower, that's fine with me, but the reason why I put the second bill in and we cap it at 8,100, we're not going up to 14,000. We're not looking at these bigger trucks. Uh, we're keeping it at a standard, smaller version of a pickup truck. I've seen the bigger pickup trucks that usually have six wheels, four in the back and two in the front, but no, we're keeping it at a limit of 8,100 pounds. Thank you, Senator Aptakis. Thank you, Senator Acosta. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, uh, Senator De Palma. To hold, please. Senator Felag moves to Second. hold. Second by Senator De Palma. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator De Palma. Yes. Senator Felag. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. Senator Acosta. Yes. Senator Cano. Yes. Senator Murray. Yes. Senator Seveny. Senator Seveny, yes. Senator Sosnowski. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. We will hold that uh, legislation. Um, next, we'll take up Senate Bill 165, also by Senator Aptakis, on generally the same topic as we talked about, an act related to taxation, sales and use taxes, liability, and competition. Um, Senator Aptakis, I know you spoke about this bill in, during the last bill, but certainly uh, any other comments you wish to make on, on Senate Bill 165? No, not at all. It just, again, increases the weight to encompass uh, four-door pickup trucks, a little bit larger pickup truck. And that, that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee on the legislation? Hearing none, Senator De Palma makes a motion to hold, second by Senator Sebney. Would the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator De Palma. Yes. Senator Felag. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. Senator Acosta. Yes. Senator Cano. Yes. Senator Murray. Yes. Senator Sebney. Yes. Senator Sosnowski. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. We will hold that legislation. Um, thank you, Senator Aptakis, uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, next on our agenda is Senate Bill 42 by Senator Sebney, an act relating to state affairs and government, Department of Administration. Senator Sebney. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. So this bill has been around for a little while. Uh, uh, it, it never has made it to the floor. What this does is uh, establish uh, some requirements for uh, the Department of Administration, and specifically the people who manage the state vehicle fleet, uh, to start uh, purchasing or leasing uh, uh, so-called ZEVs, zero emission vehicles, in place of uh, 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 standard vehicles over time. It's a it, it's a five or six year plan to to uh, starts at fifteen percent of the fleet gets replaced in twenty two, and every year it successively increases until you get to twenty twenty nine, and it's a uh, it's it's at a, a fifty percent metric at that point, where uh, at least half the vehicles that you're purchasing. Uh, for the for the uh, state fleet are, are electric vehicles, zero emission vehicles. Um, I did meet. Uh, there, there's some there's some support. There's some supporting testimony. Uh, I did meet with uh, the DOA folks who manage the fleet, and we're still working out some issues with the numbers. They're concerned that uh, that the bill might put them in a place where they. Uh, you know, they, they can't really meet those numbers for a variety of, re of, of reasons, some of which I think, you know, need to be looked at. Some of them, I think they're just, you know, trying to be, you know, they're just concerned. Um, so I'm going to need a little more time to iron this stuff out. So uh, I'd be happy to take any questions and, 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 and then we can get into the testimony if you wish. But, uh, but this bill certainly, I think, needs to be held. I've got to do... Uh, further study. Okay. Thank you, Senator Sebney. Uh, are there any questions or comments from members of the committee for Senator Sebney? Okay. Uh, hearing none, we do have witnesses signed up to testify on this legislation. Uh, first is Kai Salem uh, with Green Energy Consumers Alliance in support of the legislation. Kai, welcome to Senate Finance. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the committee and the chair. My name is Kai Salem, and I am testifying in favor of uh, Senator 70's EV fleets bill. Um, this is a great next step to start implementing the uh, Governor Raimondo's executive order to lead by example, uh, in which the governor promised to have government agencies lead on climate action and the transition to clean energy. Electric transportation, and in particular electric vehicles, are um, one of the most important steps towards decarbonizing. Recently, uh, the Act on Climate passed out of committee in the Senate uh, and is coming to a floor vote in the Senate next week. The Act on Climate says that Rhode Island needs to do more to act on its climate goals. Transportation is the biggest driver of carbon emissions in Rhode Island, and uh, the Rhode Island government can start leading and reducing emissions from transportation by converting its fleet to electric vehicles. This is uh, an important next step and it's also very doable. Many electric vehicles are currently on the market and the price of these electric vehicles is rapidly falling. Operating costs 
costs for electric vehicles as well as maintenance are already much lower uh, than comparable gas cars. Some automakers, including GM, have recently uh, committed to making all of their fleets electric uh, in the coming years. So if this is a great time to start implementing the bill uh, that Senator Seven has introduced and moving towards um, bringing Rhode Island's fleets into the future by making them more electric. Uh, so I will submit written testimony as well that can provide more information on the availability of electric vehicles, the doability of this goal, uh, and the importance towards meeting our climate goals. Thank you so much, Kai. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Hearing none, thank you so much for your testimony this evening. Thank you. Next to testify this evening is James Crowley, representing the Conservation Law Foundation in support of the legislation. James, welcome to Senate Finance. Hi. Uh, thank you to Chair Pearson and members of the committee, and thank you to Senator Seveny and the other sponsors for introducing this legislation. Uh, my name is James Crowley, and I'm an attorney at Conservation Law Foundation. I'm here to speak in support of Senate Bill 42, which would require that increasing percentages of newly purchased state vehicles be zero emission vehicles or ZEBs. Uh, Conservation Law Foundation is a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization that works to protect the environment and public health throughout New England. We support efforts to cut our greenhouse gas emissions and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And an important piece of that is decarbonizing our transportation sector. Transportation causes more carbon pollution than any other source in the United States. In Rhode Island, cars, trucks, and other equipment contributed 36% of the state's emissions in 2016, more than any other source. Tailpipe pollution also causes asthma and other health problems, especially in low-income communities and communities of color. It's clear that any strategy to tackle greenhouse gas pollution has to include a plan for reducing emissions from transportation. A critical part of cleaning up transportation is moving away from vehicles that burn gas or diesel and towards zero-emission vehicles. This bill would require the state to lead by example and replace dirty vehicles in state vehicle fleets with zero emission vehicles. This bill represents a meaningful step towards decarbonizing Rhode Island's transportation sector, as we currently lack enforceable targets for electrification of state fleets. Governor Raimondo signed an executive order that included some zero emission vehicle targets in 2015, but those targets are not enforceable and they expire in 2025. We hope that the targets in this bill will be strengthened in the future and that Rhode Island will continue to pursue other policies to make zero emission vehicles more affordable and accessible. In closing, I'd just like to reiterate that it's vital that we continue to reduce the emissions produced by our state's transportation sector if we're going to meet the state's goals under the Resilient Rhode Island Act to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and prevent the worst impacts of climate change. We therefore ask that you support S42 and pursue more ambitious efforts to decarbonize our state's fleets and transportation sector in the future. Thanks for your time, and I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you so much, James. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee for James? Hearing none, thank you, James, for your testimony. Thank you. Next to testify this evening is Hank Webster, representing the Acadia Center in support of the legislation. Hank, welcome to Senate Finance. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Hank Webster, and I am the Rhode Island Director of Acadia Center. We're a clean energy uh, research and advocacy organization that operates throughout the Northeast, and I'm very happy to testify in support of this bill tonight. Uh, and I wanted to thank Senator Seveny for his leadership on, on the effort and all the other sponsors as well. Uh, as some of my colleagues have uh, already testified, uh, transportation is the leading source of, of air pollution and carbon emissions in Rhode Island. Uh, and so it's it's completely appropriate for the state to uh, lead by continue leading by example uh, in this area, and it's also a really good value for taxpayers because uh, EVs have a much lower fueling and maintenance cost, and given Rhode Island's relatively small geographic size and um, and the the sort of trip counts or mileage counts for a state vehicle on any given day. Uh, EVs really fit perfectly because they come back to their their parking area, uh, wherever the that might be throughout the state, and they charge up overnight, and they're ready to go again in the morning, uh, and it cuts out unnecessary trips to the gas station. Um, and again, with lower maintenance costs, there's less downtime. Uh, one aspect of this bill's approach um, would really benefit from uh, 
you know, with working with the state fleet administrator and looking at vehicles that are coming to the end of their useful life and really evaluating whether or not that vehicle um, needs to be uh, replaced in kind uh, with maybe, uh, you know, something that doesn't have an electric counterpart yet, um, or if it can be met with an electric vehicle uh, right now, especially if you look at uh, the use case, maybe it doesn't need to go out in a snow emergency, so you don't need to find a four-wheel drive vehicle. There's certainly been some some tendency to, to I guess, over over purchase um, on capabilities where perhaps it's not necessary. And there are four-wheel drive electric vehicles. There's just not as many available right now. That will obviously change over the next 15 years as companies like GM and others uh, phase out gas vehicles. Um, so as a final note, I'll just say I'm a, I'm a complete electric vehicle convert. I'll never buy a gas-powered vehicle again. Uh, and I'd be happy to address any technical concerns uh, or, or questions about EVs or the state's adoption of EVs uh, that the committee has or, or any questions in general. And I uh, just want to thank again for the opportunity to testify. Hank, thank you so much for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, Hank, thank you so much for your testimony this evening. Thank you. Um, that does conclude our uh, testimony on Senate Bill 42. Uh, Senator Seveny. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion that we hold this for further study. Senator, right Senator Seveny makes a motion to hold, second by Senator De Palma. Would the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator De Palma. Yes. Senator Felag. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. Senator Acosta. Yes. Senator Cano. Yes. Senator Murray. Yes. Senator Seveny. Yes. Senator Sosnowski. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we will hold that legislation. Uh, next, we'll take up Senate Bill 476 by Senator Paolino, uh, an act relating to taxation, liability, and competition. Senator Paolino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this act would exempt from sales and use tax that portion of a, mo of a motor vehicle lease payment collected for tangible personal property tax, municipal property tax, excise, or any other similar tax. So basically, a constituent asked me recently why a statement looked like the following. It showed that the personal property tax, town of Lincoln, assessed at you know, uh, 233.69, and then it showed the tax that was uh, on top of the property tax assessed for another 1636. So, uh, you know, I double-checked the math, and I realized that essentially this is double taxation. So I believe this is one of the reasons uh, people complain about living in Rhode Island. We constantly hear that we are ranked poorly in so many areas from our consumers, and double taxation cannot help that reputation. Let's help change that so we can help consumers who lease cars in Rhode Island. Um, let's eliminate the sales tax on the property tax. This will not only help the Rhode Island consumer, but it will also help businesses for the, leasing, for the car leasing or finance company leased cars in Rhode Island. Uh, ultimately, I hope that we can continue to the car tax phase out, which the governor did mention today that would be continuing, at least in his proposal. Um, that would make all of our constituents celebrate. Uh, that's a subject for another day. For now, let's give Rhode Island and consumers in Rhode Island an exemption on paying a tax on top of a tax. I appreciate your support for this tax cutting pro-consumer and pro-business measure. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Otherwise, I urge you to vote for this important legislation. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Paolino. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, we do have one witness signed up to testify. Um, Steve Angelone in support of the legislation. Okay, looks like we weren't able to get a hold of Steve, um, but we will note his testimony and that he wanted to be in support. Um, we do have a fiscal note on this, and it would be something we'd have to incorporate in the budget. Um, Senator Paolino, do you have a motion? Chairman, I think Senator Acosta had a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator Acosta, do you have a question? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I had a question regarding um, the fiscal notes that we received, um, but also the, the written testimony. So someone from the tax department um, had proposed amending some of the language to make it so that it was clearer which tax exactly we were trying to address. Um, I realized that we got that about an hour, hour and a half before the meeting, so I don't know if you had a chance to see that, Senator Paulino, but um, if you have, do you have any answers to that yet? And if not, uh, is it something that you're willing to entertain? 
Yes, I spoke with Nina uh, just a little while ago. Um, I'm very much open to uh, you know changing the legislation, how it needs to be changed to make everybody happy. Uh, so I look forward to talking with them uh, and making those changes so that it's more palatable for everybody. Uh, one other thing real quick, my constituent did message me. He did say that he was trying to get through. If we could maybe try and call him again, I would appreciate it. Um, but Mr. Chairman, as you, as you wish. We will, uh, we will make that endeavor uh, right now, Senator. Hold on one second. Thank you. Steve, welcome to Senate Finance. Hi, thank you for uh, contact today. How's everybody doing today? I think, we're, I think we're doing well. It's almost Friday. It's almost Friday, it's 70 degrees, and so we're doing okay. Excellent, excellent. Please, please proceed with your testimony. So, um, again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you folks. And it, you know, came to my attention over uh, many, uh, Many lease payments, we were paying a property tax, um, uh, a sales tax on the property tax. And, uh, you know, to me, it seems like it's double taxation. And um, even though it's not a, uh, you know, significant amount of money, you know, it, it hurts our state in, in, uh, in more than just the, the tax um, position. You know, I think that, you know, when people find out that, we, we pay a sales tax on a property tax, you know, people kind of shake their heads. So, you know, it doesn't do any of us any good where we're trying to attract, you know, new businesses to the state and uh, their employees would be subject to that sort of thing. You know, the property tax on automobiles, I know that's a separate issue which you folks have addressed. But that's basically uh, that in a nutshell. And, um, uh, you know, was um, uh, nice enough to, to bring it up and, try to get a bill passed, and um, that's pretty much where I stand. Thank you so much, Steve. Are there any questions or comments from the committee for Steve? Mr. Chairman, just a comment. Steve, thank you very much for coming in to testify and uh, for suggesting this legislation. Very much appreciated. Very good. I hope, I hope you folks are able to um, get rid of it. I think it'll be uh, good, good for our promotion of our state in the long, in the long run. Thank you, thank you so much, Steve, for your testimony this evening. We do appreciate it. Okay, you guys have a good day. Thank you again. Thank you, you Bye -bye. too. Senator Paolino. Yep, motion to hold, please. This motion by Senator Paolino to hold, second by Senator De Palma. Would the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator De Palma. Yes. Senator Felag. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. Senator Acosta. Yes. Senator Cano. Yes. Senator Murray. Yes. Senator Murray, yes. Senator Seventy. Yes. Senator Sosnowski. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. We will hold that legislation. Uh, next on our agenda this evening is Senate Bill 227 by Senator Felag, an act related to taxation, sales and use taxes, liability and computation. Senator Felag. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is a, a very simple bill, but it had major ramifications um, on three different types of uh, industries. And the bill took place, I believe, or the implementation of this particular tax took place in about 2012. Uh, the reason why I know is my wife hasn't talked to me since because she owns a clothing store and they started taxing uh, clothes. But uh, basically, what is this particular aspect of the bill only entails two portions. Uh, I stayed away from the close. That's way my wife still don't talk to me, but it's uh, reinstating the uh, tax exemption for uh, cabs, for taxis, and for pet grooming services. Uh, it's minimum amount of money, and I feel that these three industries really cut the short end of the stick when the, town, the states were looking for more revenue sources. 
And what they should have done is when they had better years, like they've had the last few years, is to be able to uh, eliminate this tax. And that's basically the structure of it. Uh, we want to be friendly. We want to be friendly towards our pets. And, and it's why should we have a tax when a community or a Senate district like mine borders Massachusetts that doesn't have this tax. So that's it in a nutshell. Thank you, Senator Felag. Senator Cano. Thank you, Chairman. Senator Filak, I just want to say thank you so much for putting this legislation in and allow me to support the legislation as a co-sponsor. Um, just like you, I also represent a community that is bordered to Massachusetts, and within my community, we do have, um, you know, very quality uh, pet shop uh, boarding services, and I think that we just need to make sure that we continue to be friendly and we, we need to continue to eliminate, uh, you know, these type of taxes that um, make us um, no competitive to our neighbor states. So I just want to say thank you so much for um, your leadership on this bill and thank you for allowing me to co-sponsor. I know it's important for my community as well. Thank you, Senator Cano. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Senator Acosta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator Felag and Senator Cano, for, for your, your voice on these issues. I, I have a question about what we believe, and you know, I use the royal we here as, as a group, but what we believe should be the definition of a service. Because I, I think, I, I really appreciate the historical perspective that Senator Felag just offered. And I think one of the problems is that we are kind of picking and choosing what service to tax at different points in time when we do and don't need money. And that makes it sort of arbitrary to me, right? So if, if I didn't have a constituent who has pet shops or who has a pet or sells clothes or who has a taxi company or drives a taxi, then maybe I would care less about this um, than if I did, as you guys have, have kind of spoken up and become champions for these issues. So what are the things that we should consider services and how do we create a more objective way of taxing those things so that we're not doing these kind of one-off rule changes every decade or so when we do need money or when we don't need money? That's the million dollar question. Uh, back in uh, when uh, Governor Chafee was on board, uh, he listed maybe about 150 items that he wanted to tax at 1% and bring all the other items that were taxed at 7% to 6%. But that was shut down. And the reason was obviously that was shut down is because once you started at 1%, what's to stop you from next year making it 2%, making it 3%, making it 4%. And so what it seems to me happened since then is the new governors have got that list and any time they want to uh, derive some revenue to balance their budget and their presentation, they just arbitrarily pick a winner and a loser. And they pick various individuals or, in, or eight service agencies to be taxed, whether they be, uh, you know, what was the last couple of years, the uh, posters or uh, other individuals that do uh, uh, modifications to your home home design is we're going to be taxed and a lot of those entities we ended up stopping them but it's again i feel it's just an arbitrary thing yeah so so as, i guess as a, as a follow-up and, and something that would, would help me and i'd be interested in talking to more of the, you know the colleagues on this committee and in the broader senate offline about this but it, I, I think like anytime there's an exchange of money uh, that's a service Arguably, we should be taxing it. Now, should we be taxing it at 7%? It's probably the, the, the million dollar question, right? Ideally, if you tax every exchange of money at 2%, you'd probably be producing more, but then you'd be taxing every single exchange, which could be okay. It could amount to less than if you're taxing just particular things at 7%. But I, I, I thank you for exposing the arbitrariness of this, which I think is, is much more problematic and something we're going to have to figure out as we go forward. Are there any witnesses, uh, Mr. Chairman? Senator Felag, we do have uh, one witness signed up. Uh, one witness to sign up is Robert Wheeler, testifying in support of the legislation.
Robert, welcome to Senate Finance. Thank you, Senator Pearson and, and other members of the, the committee. I, uh, I very much appreciate giving me the opportunity to, to testify on this bill. I wish you could all see my face because this is one of those bills where I would be showing you a very pleading face, a very, you know, begging face of um, please take action on this bill. This bill has been up for at least the last four or five years or so, um, and it's never made it out of committee. And um, I'm really hoping that we can at least make it out of committee and just try to try to set uh, a level game plan um, playing field. I also appreciate Senator Costa's comments just now. You'll, you'll notice in my written testimony that I do call this tax arbitrary. I have a little bit more of a, a cynical point of view as to how these losers, if you will, are, are selected. I think they're selected based on industries that are not well organized or centralized. They're, they're not... Um, they're not in a position to be necessarily be able to fight back. They're not, they're not in an organized, like a, say a restaurant or accountants or somebody like that that has a, a, an association that can testify on their behalf or, or, or lobby on their behalf. Instead, they're smaller industries that really are not well organized. And um, we try amongst ourselves in the pet services space, um, I've been trying to work with my peers to make sure we, we at least coordinate uh, and make each other aware of things that are happening, but um, it does strike me that this bill is, is as a, at least the tax as it is right now is very arbitrary. It, it just, it, it sort of, it doesn't apply to any tax philosophy um, that the state seems to be putting forward um, at all. Um, just quickly, I would just re highlight some of my, uh, items of my written testimony. Um, I really represent three constituents. I am a pet owner. I own three dogs. Um, and so I am paying the tax um, uh, on, a, on a daily basis for, for everything that I do for my dog. As Senator Cano mentioned, um, and she can attest, my home is uh, right on the um, Massachusetts border. And so it would be actually shorter for me to go into Massachusetts. There's a shorter drive to go into Massachusetts to get services, and it would be 7% cheaper to get that same service in Massachusetts, um, meaning that there's literally no uh, the incentive for me to actually shop for those services in Rhode Island. Um, second, I think hopefully you may have heard from other people, or you will hear from other people, um, at least in the pet services space, that the professionals in the space are somewhat paying the tax, um, you may have heard, uh, you may see something to the effect of, you know, the, the, a real life example um, is a groomer that will uh, provide a service, so say the grooming costs $45. Um, the tax on layered on top of that would make it $48.15. The consumer will give $50 regardless of how much the tax are, isn't or isn't there. Um, and so what ends up happening is the balance of that $50 will go to the groomer as a tip. So with the tax in place, the groomer is actually paying the $3.15 tax. Um, if they weren't taxed, then that groomer would be able to pocket the, the $5 as a, as a tip to them. Um, and lastly, and, 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 and I mentioned that again to be mindful of the fact that in that same groomer, um, it, it, it involves a talent drain in that that same groomer would get the $5 if they were in Massachusetts working as opposed to in Rhode Island working. Uh, the last thing is that um, I am a pet services provider and as a business, um, it's very, very, it's very difficult for me to compete with my neighbors, um, with my, with my uh, peers uh, across the border. We, uh, you know, pandemic-wise, we, we're tied to the travel industry, and so in the past the area, as I'm sure your notes are showing, the amount of revenue that the state took in last year, I, meant, I imagine, dropped a great deal. Our personal revenue in, in, in my personal business dropped 55% last in the second quarter of last year um, relative to the year before and when you factor that in to it's it's a, it's a fact of life that every a lot of businesses were impacted by the pandemic obviously 
But when you factor that in with the increased costs, what I call hidden costs by the state with uh, uh, doing things like, for example, raising unemployment rates, unemployment insurance rates, or um, uh, um, the, the, the tangible taxes that we pay, they're, they're sort of hidden rates, costs that consumers don't see, it makes us on a competitive level that much more of a challenge t- to interface with the state, uh, with, our, with our peers across the border. Um, so, you know, I'd just like to close that two years ago at the, at the same hearing, um, every single member of the committee voiced uh, of, of, and embraced this bill and wanted to see this passage. Um, I think Senator Felix said it right that, you know, this is just something that was seemingly arbitrary and it just needs some uh, a, a kind of a stain on, on the state's uh, business-friendly kind of approach. Um, and yet the bill didn't get any traction. And, you know, one of the things I closed in, the, in my testimony at that time that it just seems like there's a very, this is clearly a right thing in this, in this case. Um, and while I understand that it will present budget challenges elsewhere, um, I think that the fact that it is a right thing to do should trump everything else and should take precedent over everything else. So I do hope you will move this forward. And, and certainly if anybody has any questions, I am available to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Senator Cano. Thank you so much, Chairman. I just want to say to Mr. Wheeler, thank you so much for your advocacy. Um, as many of you know, Mr. Wheeler is my constituent, but um, also a very uh, proud owner of a kennel service in Pawtucket. And um, he has been coming since I got elected to the Senate. I have seen him coming to testify of the importance of us passing this legislation. And um, every year, uh, he makes sure that he is not only telling us the impact, but also, uh, you know, the voice of um, many other of his colleagues in um, the industry. I just want to say thank you, Mr. Wheeler, for always being a voice and for um, letting us know how we can make things better. And um, hopefully we can pass this legislation um, um, this year. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Cano. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Wheeler? Senator Felag. Uh, I just want to uh, thank him for his uh, advocacy on this particular issue. I, I think I remarked at the time that uh, we were, uh, in 2012, uh, trying to promote our state as a tourism destination. And all I could think of at the time was the fact that we had increased the tolls on the, uh, the bridges. So you have a family coming over for a vacation into Newport or somewhere in Rhode Island. They had to pay an increase in the tolls. If they wanted to uh, go and uh, take a taxi while they were there, this was prior to Uber being uh, so efficient, it would have cost them more in taxes. If they wanted to get their pet groomed, they would cost them more in taxes. If they wanted to go and purchase some clothing, it cost them more in taxes. If they wanted to go to a restaurant at the time, the year before we had increased the, uh, the taxes from 7% to 8% to give it back to the communities. And then there was one other entity that where everywhere you turned around for a tourist, there was an increase in taxation, which to me, it wasn't the right uh, welcoming to the state of Rhode Island. Thank you so much, Senator Felag. Are there any other questions or comments for Mr. Wheeler? Hearing none, Mr. Wheeler, thank you so much for your testimony this evening. Thank you, take care. Thank you. Um, with that, that does conclude the testimony we have on Senate Bill 227. Um, Senator Felag? A uh, motion to hold, and hopefully we'll find some funds to uh, Eliminate this tax. Second. 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 Senator Felag makes a motion to hold. Second by Senator Cano. Would the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator <coughs> De Palma. Yes. Senator Felag. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. Senator Acosta. Yes. Senator Cano. Yes. Senator Murray. Yes. Senator Seveny. Yes. Senator Sosnowski? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we will hold that legislation. Uh, Senate Bill 298 is next on our agenda by Senator Gallo, an act related to taxation, sales and use taxes, liability and computation. 
Uh, this does exempt uh, from sales tax the trade-in values of motorcycles. Uh, we do have a fiscal note on this legislation, um, and we do have one witness uh, signed up. I'm sorry, we have two witnesses actually signed up to testify um, on the legislation. And with the committee, just bear with us for just a moment. Paul, Hello? Welcome, welcome to yes, Senate welcome. Finance. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee members for this opportunity to speak today. Are you ready? We are. Please proceed. All right. My name is Paul Vaughn. I am the president of Rhode Island Motorcycle Association, and I speak for the association and our members here today. With regards to uh, sales trade-in tax credit for motorcycles, Bill 298, we support the bill. As the current law is the trade in a motorcycle towards a new motorcycle, new or used, receives no credit for sales tax. As an example, if you purchase a bike for $20,000 and your trade in is worth $10,000, you will pay sales tax on the $20,000 uh, instead of having the credit for ten. The sales tax instead would be $1,400 instead of a $700. This unfair practice is essentially taxing the same vehicle twice to the same person. This affects the dealers in lost sales to other states that give the credit. Connecticut and Massachusetts offer the credit along with most states. Riders with dual residency will not trade in in Rhode Island and purchase in another state with a tax credit and register it there. With dealerships having endured the closures, lack of business this year, and declining sales in the last few years, having the tax credit will increase business going forward. With more sales of bikes, including trade-ins, which will sell for more than the trade-in value, the sales tax will not be lost. It will be increased instead. When riders purchase a new used bike, they personalize the bike with accessories to make it theirs. Along with motor clothes, parts, and collectibles, that can add over $5,000 worth of sales in the first year of ownership. It is a known fact measured by manufacturers and dealers throughout the country as a metric of dealer success. Riders will trade in more often when their trade has a tax credit. This will increase sales in numbers of bikes sold and increase revenue for the state over the existing policy. Not only will the new bike sales be increased, but the dealer would have more late model used bikes to sell than they have now. Just because the non-tax credit is how things have always been does, done, does not mean that today's business climate, that's the best way to continue. With REMA having worked closely with Lieutenant Governor, now Governor Dan McKee, to bring this bill forward, we at Rhode Island Motorcycle Association urge you to pass this important bill and bring equity and fairness to the motorcycle dealers in Rhode Island so they can succeed and continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, Paul, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Uh, next to testify on the legislation is Lou Petrucci uh, in support of the legislation. Lou, welcome to Senate Finance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Lou Petrucci, and I'm, all, I'm here also to testify in favor of this bill. This is a bill that has been introduced a number of years now. Um, it's ironic that you mentioned that there was a uh, fiscal impact uh, study done on it. I, 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 I think uh, it's more like a fiscal neutral, this, this bill, uh, because of what was already said. The, that motorcycle that's traded in, uh, 
you don't lose those monies. That mark, that bike doesn't disappear. It, it does. It does end up being sold. Um, when it's sold, there's a tax on that. Uh, the accessories that are added to it, there's a tax. So actually, the, the chances are that the revenue is going to uh, that it's generated is going to be even more so. Plus, um, some groups that I've talked to, not a lot, but I talked to a few groups. Um, that to them, these are deal breakers. When it comes down to that uh, that tax that they have to pay the full tax on that, with, even with the trading. So um, I think all in all, if you look at this thing, if you really look at it with an open mind, you're going to find that this uh, this going uh, going into in line with what our neighboring states do. You're going to find that it could be more of a a uh, dollar generator than a, 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 a pendant on us. I got. It. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you so much, Lou. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the committee for for Lou? Hearing none, Lou. Thank you so much for your testimony this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you. Um, that does conclude our testimony on Senate Bill 298 this evening. Senator De Palma? Motion to hold. Senator De Palma makes a motion to hold, second by Senator Sebony. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson? Yes. Senator De Palma? Yes. Senator Felag? Senator Felag? Senator Paolino? Yes. Senator Acosta? Yes. Senator Cano? Yes. Senator Murray? Yes. Senator Seveny? Yes. Senator Sosnowski? Yes. Eight in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clark. We will hold that legislation. Uh, next on our agenda this evening is Senate Bill 299 by Senator Gallo, an act related to taxation, sales and use taxes, liability and computation. Um, this exempts the trade-in value of pickup trucks weighing 14,000 pounds or less from the sales and use tax. Uh, it is very similar to some legislation that we had heard earlier, uh, and we do have a fiscal note for this. Um, there is no one signed up to testify on this legislation. Are there any motion questions? Hold. Senator Paul makes a motion to hold. Second. Second by Senator Seveny. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson. Yes. Senator De Palma. Yes. Senator Felag. Yes. Senator Paolino? Yes. Senator Acosta? Senator Acosta? Yes. Senator Cano? Yes. Senator Murray? Yes. Senator Seveny? Yes. Senator Sosnowski? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, next on our agenda is Senate Bill 301 by Senator Gallo, an act related to taxation, sales and use taxes, liability and computation. Um, this increases the amount of exemption from sales tax for clothing, including footwear, from $250 to $1,000. Um, again, this is a piece of legislation we've heard before as well. Um, there is a uh, fiscal note, I know it did come up earlier um, in the conversation. Um, there are no witnesses signed up to testify. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, not that I buy shoes that are anywhere near that, but having bought daughter's wedding shoes, I can certainly attest to the cost of wedding shoes, of which I still have the box. I'm not going to get rid of the box. If somebody wants to give me two box, I've got to give me two box. Senator, you could, have, you could have surprised me. I thought that you did buy shoes at that price point, but um, perhaps, perhaps you're just I'm a sorry. bargain shopper. Yes. I think all of them add up to that. <laughs> yeah. How about hats, Lou? <laughs> Next time. Se Senator, right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Acosta. Well, no, I, I, I was going to kind of piggyback off that point. I, I wear, you know, very nice, uh, none that cost a thousand dollars, though. And so my guess is that like this exemption was about protecting working class people and making them able to to purchase individual items. But because it's about individual items, I'm not sure what individual item at a thousand dollars or nine hundred ninety nine dollars people are purchasing that we're trying to like help them be able to purchase when it comes to clothes and footwear. Uh, <laughs> I would be happy to, to be convinced. 
be like suits. Some people that purchase suits or right. overcoats, or there could potentially be some dresses, uh, wedding dresses, those kind of, kind of things that could go to that price. Yeah, yeah Senator, I was just, I was just talking to the shoes, having done that twice now. So, but I, I but I have the box. So if you need the box, I got the box. Yeah. Also, you're not going to Givenchy in my family. Like you get your shoes at Payless. Because uh, <laughs> we don't got $1,000 kind of shoot money. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, Senator Paul, Senator Paul makes a motion to hold, second by Senator Seveny. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Pearson? Yes. Senator De Palma? Yes. Senator Felag? Yes. Senator Paolino? Yes. Senator Acosta? Yes. Senator Cano? Yes. Senator Murray? Yes. Senator Seveny? Yes. Senator Sosnowski? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, next on our agenda this evening is Senate Bill 368 by Senator Gallo, an act related to taxation, sales and use taxes, liability and competition, exempt certain equipment procured or rented by a contractor performing construction work for the state, any city or town, or any quasi-public entity from the sales and use tax. Uh, this is legislation we do also have a fiscal note on, and there is no witnesses signed up to testify, or there are no witnesses signed up to testify. Uh, are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, Senator De Palma makes a motion to hold, second by Senator Seveny. With the clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Pearson? Yes. Senator De Palma? Yes. Senator Felag? Yes. Senator Paolino? Yes. Senator Acosta? Yes. Senator Cano? Yes. Senator Murray? Yes. Senator Seveny? Yes. Senator Sosnowski? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. We will hold that piece of legislation. Um, that does conclude our agenda this evening. Congratulations to the Finance Committee. This is our first meeting of the year that has gone, I believe, just under an hour. Uh, and with that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second so by, right. Motion by Senator Felix, second by Senator Palma. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night.